Okay, thank you very much, Falguni. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. It was very uh, on short notice, and I'm very happy that uh, the Zurich team invited me to uh, to uh, support them. As uh, as you said, I'm an anthropologist, uh, but at the same time, I'm interested to connect the academic ethnographic knowledge with or approaches with uh, political and aesthetic strategies of knowledge production and uh, intervention. Um, what I want to do here is to present some of my thoughts about the rearticulation of public spaces in the context of changing global power relations. And one main interest lies in the configuration of how different publics are connected and negotiated transnationally, and how subjects deal with multiple positions in different publics. Further, I'm particularly interested in how differences of class, ethnicity, race, and gender are commodified, excluded, or recognized in these entangled spaces. So, as you can see, Bollywood Yoga and IT, some of you, especially the local audience. The global, uh, the local audience might be very familiar with some of, of these ideas. And one could say it's uh, either a coincidence that I'm talking about uh, these things in, in Bombay, or one can say, no, actually, it's also some kind of contingency in the context of uh, more and more Western educational institutions and research uh, coming to Asia and trying to, uh, to build up collaborations with non-European and Western uh, countries. So when I talk about the uh, public, I want to stress the double understanding of representation as discussed by Gaitri Spivak. The public then combines the formal political realm of citizenship, but also the politics of representation in a cultural space of being heard and seen and felt. So this issue of the public is particularly relevant to Switzerland, I think, as the country has the highest hurdles to naturalization in Europe and therefore one-fourth of the population has no political rights. Similarly, migrants and their offspring, which represent almost one half of the population, are underrepresented in media and other public institutions. At the same time, Switzerland has since the mid-19th century relied on migrants for its economic growth and prosperity. So compared to, like, uh, to the other countries in Europe, it has the highest uh, migration influx. At the same time, it has the highest hurdles to naturalization. So there are some very important, I think, contradictions in this, uh, in this model uh, of prosperity in Switzerland that have to be discussed and are very much connected to the understanding of the public as a political sphere and as a cultural sphere. So one important... Um, One important uh, way to construct the public as a national and, and racial sphere was, uh, as I uh, said, a very restrictive policy against uh, immigrants after the beginning in the, in the early 20th century, but especially uh, after Second World War. So this is like a, um, a, a political um, campaign which wanted to uh, restrict the level of uh, migration, of immigration, or of migrants within Switzerland to 10% in the 1970s. This would have meant that 200,000 or 300,000 of Italian guest workers would have, to, would have to leave Switzerland. And this uh, very restrictive populist uh, policies are still, uh, are still very relevant at the moment. As you can see, this is like the, the, the main station of Zurich where the campaign against building of minarets was uh, very aggressively campaigned and actually also accepted. So in, in Switzerland, it's not possible to build minarets. Uh, so you can see this anti-Islamic racism is very strong. So on the one hand, there is like this very restrictive understanding of who shall be Swiss and how this is represented in the public sphere. Yet I would argue and also discuss, I would like to discuss how this construction of the national public space is destabilized and defendant 
multiplied at the same time in the context of global capitalism, as I want to uh, discuss in the context of the changing post-colonial relationships between Switzerland and India. As an entry point, I want to discuss uh, this event, which took place in the main hall of Zurich main station, so the, main pl uh, the same place where this uh, political campaign was, uh, was uh, shown in the year 2008. So this three-day uh, Mega Mela at Zurich Central Station was a the spectacular highlight of the Grüezi Indi India Summer Festival, which was organized by the Indian Association of Zurich. The goal was to celebrate the 60th anniversary of the Swiss Indo Friendship Treaty of 1948. This was actually the first friendship treaty India had after independence. This treaty had never been publicly, publicly commemorated in Switzerland or in India before, but in 2008, almost out of nothing, a myriad of state actors, private companies, as well as diasporic entrepreneurs, organizations, and individuals assembled around this symbolic occasion. So what was at stake at this historical moment? To be sure, Swiss publics, as all the European ones, have been diffused by Orientalist knowledge since the Romanticists' musings for the antique Indian civilization from the early 19th century. And also the hippie movement revived this Orientalist dream in a counterculture at the margin of bourgeois Switzerland, or middle-class Switzerland. But the Megamela in the midst of the Swiss public articulated something new. As for the Indian Association of Zurich and the diasporic middle-class community, it represented the publicity of the, um, the publicity of the Mega Mela fueled the momentum of recognition and pride. And for the, thus the government of Zurich, after a long period committed to a policy of assimilation, beca began welcoming its migrant communities in order to celebrate its multicultural appeal as a global city, as Christoph uh, mentioned. For the Indian state, again, the Mega Mela was a showcase of shining India as the country promoted itself as a powerful global player after the liberalization process since the late 1980s. The Swiss federal president in her speech officially acknowledged India as a rising superpower instead of a developing country in need of development aid. Doing so, she confirmed Switzerland's vested interest in entering the emerging markets opened up. And finally, the audience at the Mega Mela were not hippies, as in the 1970s, but a diverse urban middle class or business class, which consumed Indian exotica as an exciting cosmopolitan moment in everyday routine. So how can this public presence and productivity of Indianness and hybridity under, be understood in the, changing, in the context of changing post-colonial relationships between Switzerland and India and in the context of global capitalism? I think to understand what was happening here, this sudden presence and celebration of Indianness, one has to go back to this friendship treaty, which was actually very interesting because Switzerland had since the late 19th century very lively economic and political relationships to, uh, to India, especially the company Falkart Brothers, one of the main cotton uh, exporters, uh, in India was very important, was an important um, industrialist, uh, how shall I say, energy for the whole industrialization of, of Switzerland. The whole textile industry was very much uh, fostered by, by Falkart. And the friendship treaty from the Swiss perspective was very obviously a way to, uh, to secure these economic interests and this was only possible in a true stepping out of the, of the, the, the how shall I say, the, the junior partnership with the colonial empire. So Switzerland was able to promote itself as a partner, a paternalist partner of uh, democratic and uh, democratic nature which would support India in its modernization Nehruvian period. So you can see here it seems advisable to grant them or countrymen, especially one specific trading company which was Falkart, our support and if necessary our protection in the following years which could yield 
seismic changes, not to mention the economic potentials in the future. So I just wanted to make this, this, this uh, short excourse to the colonial history of Switzerland to, to, to stress that the public space of Switzerland was obviously connected and entangled in a global history of, of, uh, of colonial endeavor. So it's to understand what was happening in, uh, in Zurich in 2008 and what is happening now has to be seen from a global perspective. So what is interesting and I would argue is that like this, this commemoration of the 60th uh, uh, jubilee of, of the Friendship Treaty also marks a very important moment in these relationships especially the moment particularly where Switzerland realizes that, Swi that India has, um, has um, entered the, the stage from the Swiss perspective of, of global economy, something which was not realized before. And as you can see, like this, this whole uh, issue of Bollywood, and as many commentators on Bollywood have, have shown, is that like, within Bollywood, not only in the, in the plots, but also in the whole global distribution, there is like a claim to capitalism from, uh, from India. So you can see actually here in the midst of Zurich, perhaps not this film on the, on the screen, but others, that there is something going on outside of Switzerland, which is on the one hand realized, but not fully acknowledged. As I would show, like, there were always films shot in, uh, since uh, the 1990s in Switzerland, but for the Swiss people, this was not uh, an experience of, okay, there is another uh, country or film industry, but rather it was a curiosity. It was not a symbol of this claim of being, uh, stepping out of this, um, of this um, black past of colonialism and, and, and Muslim uh, invasion, how it was uh, very often shown. But as I argue this was, as I would like to argue, this was not seen as something which is happening out there, but it was rather included in a strategy of the city to, uh, to integrate into global capitalism. So what we can see in Zurich from the 70s onwards and 80s onwards is the use of cultural politics, of integrating alternative spaces, subversive spaces, and also cultural difference as a way to attract global capital. So as, as Christoph nicely said, Zurich became a headquarter economy and to attract this money it was necessary and the people to offer uh, also a cultural scene or sphere which was able to, to handle this. So to, to really step out of this provinciality which was very strong in Switzerland when, when you think back at this uh, campaign in the 1970s and just trying to keep the migrants out of the public. So there had to be something, kind of a change. So there's a nice quote by the mayor of Zurich in 2004, how suddenly this, uh, this idea of, of cultural difference becomes an important commodity in the, in the global city. He says, it is a platitude to speak of a globalized world. Notions as multiculturalism belong to our world. Encounters with foreign cultures and religions are not extraordinary anymore. We don't have to step into an airplane to visit Hindu temples. Today there are Hindu temples in and around Zurich with priests, ceremonies and festivals. Indian shops offer everything what is needed for what is in need for what is needed for an authentic ritual ritual. There are many yoga centers and even more Sri Lankan restaurants. It's important to, to remember that like, while this is happening as a way to promote Zurich and also as a, like, a, a pedagogy of the state towards its provincial population, as it was put, this is happening side by side as campaigns uh, against uh, minaret building. So this is important, like this simultaneity in the, in the same space. So how to make sense of this? And I would say there was not like a political multiculturalism in Switzerland, but rather like a commercial one, which was able to, to uh, domesticate this otherness, which was uh, attracted by, by global capitalism into something uh, exotic. So 
Graham Hogan argued that exoticism describes rather a particular mode of aesthetic perception, one which renders people, objects, and places strange, even as it, as it domesticates them, and which effectively manufactures otherness, even as it claims to surrender to its imminent mysteries. So what I would argue is that like, within this very assimilationist public space, this national public space, suddenly there was also a way of uh, commercial multi multiculturalism which allowed to enter the public space for people, especially migrants, which were not legitimately uh, being able to represent themselves in public. So in my, and one example is, for example, in, in my research, this uh, a yoga teacher called Maya, she's of Indian uh, origin, and actually she started to, to do yoga to get out of the, of, her, of the conflicts with her parents, or rather to say she was in conflict. She, um, yeah, I don't know where to start. It's such an interesting biography. No, but the, the main point is that she felt somehow lonely when, when she was uh, young in her childhood and, and uh, adolescence because she was not fitting neither into the Swiss nor the Indian culture. So this, but I would argue this was not something which had to do with culture, but with like the political regime of assimilation, which really draw, drew the border between the family, the private and the public, the, the Swiss and the other. So the, the, she was really, like the boundary was drew, drawn between her, uh, within her body. I could say. So yoga was a way to find her own individualist project of, uh, of uh, be, be being a self. <clears throat> so the interesting thing is that like suddenly in this uh, multi commercial multiculturalism, she could enter as a yoga teacher and get recognition for something which she called translating between cultures. At the same time, she was very much uh, stereotyped within that. So people would ask, oh, you're good in yoga because you're Indian, which would like totally disqualify her training or her efforts. So the public space offered some way to enter, to get recognition and to subversively negotiate new spaces. But it was, she was not possible to represent her, her experience as she would uh, like to have it. But as a yoga teacher, she could travel to India and other places and really start a new business. So, <clears throat> so these exotic, exoticized spaces also allowed things to do. But like when we look at this quote by, by, by Hagen, Hagen, something which is interesting like is what is domesticated, this radical or real otherness, what is actually at stake in this way of exoticism in the context of, uh, of, of the more of this moment of global capitalism is perhaps interesting when you look at another case. This is a, a newspaper clip which says uh, the, that Credit Suisse, the Swiss bank, is uh, uh, firing Swiss people and takes uh, IT Indians. And this was actually about that uh, the newspaper clip was about that um, Swiss IT engineers were voting against mass immigration. This was like uh, an initiative which took place uh, last year, which uh, wanted to abandon the, the free movement agreement and actually did. And they, they wanted to say in this article that uh, Swiss IT engineers are scared of in, uh, IT Indian, that's why they did this racist vote. So, and it was interesting like that in this context, on the one hand, either the IT Indian, uh, Indian IT engineers were looked at as, um, as, a, as a mass of, dangerous mass of people, or as a victim of racism. But what was not seen is actually that uh, they're also part of a public, which is like the, the diaspor diasporic Indian public or global Indian modernity, where I, being IT Indian is also something which can be seen as, for example, uh, uh, a hero of, of the so-called New India, for example. 
And there's also like something else which could not be seen like in the in the in these mechanisms of global capitalism, that uh, the global Indian IT industry, as as Xiang Biao showed, is like actually a huge labor system which keeps people in a very precarious uh, position. So, the question is like, how is it possible to uh, to look at these multiple subjectivities produced? at the boundary of the Swiss national space in the context of global capitalism? How is it possible to represent, to understand, and how is it possible to, to multiply the public spaces and not just uh, um, adopt these hege hegemonic uh, positions? And I would say in Switzerland that is really a difficult task at the moment. It's not only on the level of political or legal uh, claims, but also on the, on the level of politics of representation, where this question is really difficult. And I want to give like one actually funny last example. Or here, yeah, this one is also important. I think that actually that's in, that we should not think, and that's probably the most important lesson from postcolonial studies now is not to think in the categories of the West and the rest. So what, what you could see, like in the example of, of, of uh, Indian uh, IT engineers or the, 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 the provincializing gaze of Bollywood to Switzerland is actually that uh, the former colonial subjects of Euro-American models of modernity are empowered in a post-colonial world to assert their own projects of modernity. Those who are most successful in doing so are those who have acquired an indispensable partnership in the world of global capital and demand recognition of their cultural subjectivities, invented or not, in the making of global modernity. So I would argue to, to, uh, to conclude that this kind of exoticization which is happening and at the same time the racism which is happening is also a, way, uh, a form of post-colonial anxiety which uh, is taking place in Switzerland, which is not only um, showing that the cultural authority is at stake at the moment, but even the economic authority of Switzerland as a colonial, small colonial power is at stake at, at this moment, in the moment where global capitalism is, is actually decentering. So, and I think this, uh, this, analysis of how the, the public space of Switzerland is perhaps entangled and constructed is a, might be a good uh, 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 foundation for the presentation of, of Christian and Yvonne. Thank you.